listening to AM 1080 KSEO Santa Cruz. It is 414, and we welcome you aboard Flight 1080. You're in for a special treat because coming up next, we have Ron Paul, Dr. Ron Paul, Senator. Dr. Ron Paul is joining us today. We invite you to join us as well. 831-479-1080-218-5726. DM at KSEO.com. We only have them here for a few minutes. First off, we're going to start off by welcoming Dr. Paul. Uh, Dr. Paul, are you there? I am here. Nice Boy, to be with you. I am so honored to have you here, Dr. Paul. It is an absolute thrill to have you here. My audience is going to love hearing from you. Uh, you are an, a legend, and uh, we, we thank you. I say that on behalf of me and my audience. Thank you for your uh, oh. for everything you've done. Thank you. Uh, now, now, uh, what have you been up to lately? I, I've been doing some uh, research on you here. Now you are working with the um, the Ron Paul Institute. Is this one of your newest projects? Yeah, it's one that I followed up with uh, after I left Congress with Daniel McAdams, who was working with me on foreign policy, you know, for about 10 years before I left Congress. And that's part of, uh, of a foundation I've had, the Free Foundation, but the, the, Ron, uh, the Ron Paul uh, Institute, Institute for Peace and Prosperity, and it uh, participates in a uh, programming each day, uh, a program that we uh, put out on the Internet and live stream. And uh, it's something that I look forward to doing and something I consider very important, but it deals basically with foreign policy. I have some other things going on, right? like the, uh, the, the uh, campaign for liberty and a few other projects, homeschooling project that I'm interested in. But I think I spend more time right now on the Ron Paul Institute uh, because it seems like uh, sorting out uh, today's foreign policy is a job and a half because it seems to be in flux, so to speak. What do you think about uh, America's foreign policy, just kind of in general, without getting too specific, because I wouldn't get the uh, specific specificities anyways. Um, and just in general, what do you think about America's foreign policy? Where do you think we're headed? Uh, is it, are we headed down a good uh, path or a dangerous path? What's going on? No, no I, I think we're entering an end stage of a foreign policy that we have uh, shifted to about 100 years ago, as early as Woodrow Wilson, the progressive era, where Woodrow Wilson announced we have to make the world safe for democracy, and, uh, and we've been involved a long time since then. But we really got busy uh, assuming this role of uh, ma maintaining with the world order uh, by maintaining an empire after uh, the Soviet system collapsed. So we've been very, very busy, and it's gotten extremely busy for for the United States uh, to be involved uh, since 9-11, because we have spent a lot of time in the Middle East in wars that were undeclared, wars that have been unsuccessful. And uh, I, quite frankly, I think it's in the wrong direction. I think it's going to participate in our bankruptcy. And right now, uh, it's so confusing that, you know, when, when you look at some of the sorting eye that we have to do with Iran, uh, we find out that uh, right now we're in a, in a collision course with all the European countries because uh, they don't like the they were they were quite happy with us talking with and trading with uh, with Iran but now uh, you know that's sort of up in the air and and I think this is uh, a stage where we are in flux. I think we will have to give up running the world empire for financial reasons, if nothing else. But it's also going to be because a lot of people are getting tired of us, uh, you know, marching around the world and telling everybody else how to settle their problems. Uh, who, who do you see out there? First of all, you've been described as a Republican, as a libertarian. How do, how do you describe yourself and your political position? Well, uh, I've been a Republican in Congress. I was elected 12 times or so, you know, uh, as a Republican, and uh, I've been a Libertarian. I ran in the Libertarian Party. Some people, and, and I don't shy away from the word Libertarian. It merely means you believe in liberty, and most everybody has some part in them that actually endorses liberty. So li that's the Libertarian. But I don't volunteer those terms. I don't volunteer the term conservative either because there's been so much distortion there and a lot of people use that term and, and they're big sponsors of big government so uh, I like the word of a non-intervention non I think the government the, the limited government that we should have and that we were given with the constitution was to mean that the government was not supposed to be in, involved and in intervening in our lives it wasn't even supposed to be intervening in, this, in the uh, act, activities of the individual states you know the states were supposed to be running the show 
But uh, governments, I, when I was running for president, uh, kiddingly, but really quite seriously, I wanted to be president because of the things I didn't want to do. And I, I didn't want to uh, believe that the president or the executive branch should tell people how to live their own life if they're behaving themselves. That's their business. They do what they want. I don't know what they want. I don't know what's best for them. I think that's the way it should be with the economy. Nobody's smart enough in Washington. The president's not smart enough. He shouldn't be intervening in the economy and pretending that he's a central economic planner. And I certainly don't believe that we should be involved in all the problems around the world, all the border disputes and the religious disputes that have existed for a long time. So uh, being a non-intervention means we mind our own business. I think it would be best for us, and I think it fits into what was traditionally the um, American ideal, is that uh, we were supposed to look to our own ways, and I, I always believed that we our responsibility is to be a great nation but set a good standard and allow other people to look at us, and hopefully they'll want to copy us and emulate us, but we can't force it on other people, and that's where I think we get into trouble. How would you grade uh, Donald Trump? Do you think he's done damage to our reputation, or um, well, I'm, sure, I'm sure he hasn't helped. Uh, how do you rank him? Uh, up to now. He, but he's about midway through his term, just a little shy of midway. How would you grade him? Well, I wouldn't give him a very high grade, even though uh, we, <laughs> we've we had others that have been pretty bad. Um, I, I, I would look, if you look for the positive, which I like to try mm -hmm. to do, right. I mean, he, he at least said that we should have less regulation. He's done some good there. I think he's been, a, in, in that sense, that and lowering taxes and being a good cheerleader for the market, you can't argue that there hasn't been some improvement. But where we haven't had the improvement is much more serious, and that is that we're living beyond our means, and we're living beyond our means now more than ever. You know, this one year, he said he's, we have another trillion dollars. They think in a couple of years, the debt is going to go up $2 trillion a year. We, that's, that's not workable, and uh, it's, eventually something hap has to happen there. So financially, I think it's a very, very poor job. I think he's uh, too much involved uh, overseas. I, I like, uh, you know, the trend that has occurred with North Korea. That's one thing I complained about for years and years. I kept saying, you know, we went into Korea when I was in high school and we're still there and we're spending billions of dollars. And we, when we went into Vietnam, that was a disaster. We lost 60,000 people. We had to leave and left them alone. And all of a sudden, the country came together and they accepted Western ways better than North Korea did. So I think more can be achieved without throwing our weight around. And yet uh, we, we did that with Korea. But right now, you know, this is the first time they've really been talking about this. So I would, I've been doing everything I can to encourage that. And hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully Trump will say, hey, you know, maybe that is a neat idea, be winning the Nobel Prize for peace. But the, he hasn't applied that in a consistent fashion, but I do like what he's done, uh, at least where we stand right now, where we've actually opened up the door to some conversations with North Korea. We are on Facebook and Twitter at Flight 1080. Ryan asks, uh, who audits the IRS and how do we know if our taxpayer do dollars are going to what they tell us they're going to? Well, it's pretty good. The Congress is responsible for that, and they don't do it, and nobody knows where it's going. Nobody audits the, the uh, Pentagon. Nobody has any idea what we spend on the CIA and what their operations are all about. The IRS is, you know, spend their, their money. But, uh, you know, it's uh, it, hardly anything is audited. The thing that we're, I became known in Washington has been that, why don't we audit the Federal Reserve? You know, because that that's where the big bucks are, very big bucks. The, you know, when we had the crisis in, in, the, in the economy down, turning down a couple of years ago in 2009, uh, the, the uh, Federal Reserve was maneuvering and manipulating and bailing out all the banks and other countries up to the tune of $15 trillion. None of it was appropriated. Sure, the Congress spent more money and they appropriated money, but everything is done in secret with the Federal Reserve. And they have the ability to, you know, uh, print the reserve currency of the world. That literally has become like they are, uh, the, our central bank, the Federal Reserve, has been able to print the gold to back up all the currency.
currencies of the world. The big thing is it's not gold and there's no restraints. So, and that's why there's so much debt. The world is swimming in debt and they just delay the inevitable. They patch it over with even spending more money. And yes, there should be a lot of auditing. The people are derelict in, in not demanding strongly enough for the congressman to audit what they're doing. They can control everything through the purse and they don't do it. There's so much bipartisanship in Washington. When you look at the budget and all the things they do, whether it's the Federal Reserve or, this, or the wars that they fight, the Democrats and the Republicans get along quite well, you know, and uh, they fight and fume and pretend and they like the power. That's for real. But when it comes to real policy, the welfare state and the warfare state and the financial markets are controlled by both parties, which are highly influenced by the deep state, where the real influence is and the real power lies. Who, who does America owe the debt to? I mean, who, who do we all owe all this debt to? Who, who controls the debt? Uh, well, a high percentage of it will be foreigners. Uh, China it probably has the big, biggest block of it. They have over a trillion dollars of it, and uh, so they're in a, they're in a bind. If they, they they have a weapon, if they dumped our debt, they could dump the dollar, but it wouldn't be helpful to them. But uh, uh, we owe a lot overseas. But there's a, there's a lot of people we just owe it to. Uh, if you look up, you know, they say the debt is twenty one trillion dollars. But the uh, un unfunded liabilities are two hundred and ten trillion dollars. Oh, and that's, just, that's just owed to the people, you know, through Social Security and all the programs. And uh, there's not going to be enough people. You know, uh, the uh, millennials right now are still a third of them are staying at home because, in spite of all these reports, they're st they're having trouble and they and, and they uh, have too much debt because their colleges were paid with debt uh, that the student debts over a trillion dollars and then you have uh, all, all the other debts actually student debt has gotten bigger than uh, the uh, credit card debt but you can't you can't live on debt you and i could do it for a while but you know let's say the bank would loan us a, a million dollars a month mm. boy we could live a uh, live a big time right. eventually the banker says no you, we're not going to give you any more countries are a little bit differently when they get to print the money what finally happens to cut it off is the fact that the money loses its purchasing power and that's it's going on and they claim there's not much inflation but there is a lot of inflation if you go to a california a state like california and i think that's where you are mm -hmm. you know you have a lot of wealth in california but you have a lot of people who, who are on the streets because rents are high houses are high and there's a lot of inflation and that's the real culprit the real evil of the system we have it's so unfair to the middle class and to the poor the wealthy can get wealthier under this system because they get to use the money first and they benefit from all the spending whether it's the military operation or whatever but uh it it destroys the middle class and this is why you hear this noise about well what we need is socialism yeah we we need venezuela I mean, it's so so much disconnect, but we have our universities teaching this stuff, yeah. and uh, and that's where the real tragedy is. But I think one of the biggest problems we face today is is this uh, dilemma between the rich and the poor, and then blaming it on free markets and free enterprise and capitalism, which is a lie. It's it's crony capitalism. It's sort of uh, uh, you know special interests. And it has very little to do with free markets and sound money. We do not have sound money. And they couldn't do this. None of this could be financed if you couldn't print the money. But it, it meant if you had a backing to the currency, it would be limited with gold and silver. There would be limitation on the size and scope of government. And uh, yet people liked it because it's sort of like counterfeit. And the counterfeiters so far haven't been discovered. They, they, they counterfeit the money and people think they're wealthy. But eventually people discover it. Either they discover it's counterfeit money and he's a, the counterfeiter is arrested or the people realize the money's not quite worth as much as it is and then your prices start to soar. And we're at the early stages of seeing some very, very severe uh, price inflation uh, going on. And people on fixed incomes, the elderly and the retired people, they know that uh, it, that it's a tough, tough uh, battle to live within their means right now. So we face some serious economic uh, problems 
problems, and uh, just printing more money is not going to uh, work. Uh, Dave in Santa Cruz has a question for you. Dr. Paul, Dave, you're in the air. Yeah, I do. Thanks for spending some time in Santa Cruz or with Santa Cruz there, Ron. Two quick Thank questions, you. uh, your opinion. How about the uh, Mueller report? And how about, what do you think the root cause of all these school shootings is? That's no, I didn't say, what report did you say? The and Mueller, the Mueller report. report on the Mueller report on... Oh, the Mueller report. Well, I, I think it's a sham. I, I think it's horrible. I think they're missing the boy, the whole point. I think it's a distraction from the problems that I was just talking about. They want to talk about something. But I think that, you know, eventually, right now, the big question is, are we going to have an investigator investigating the investigators? You know, I, I think it's a horror. I, I think that uh, the Mueller uh, thing is not going to solve the problems as there's going to be a lot of it fighting. But right now, I mean, I don't like to even deal on this subject because it's so partisan and that fighting that, go, uh, that, that goes on. But uh, I do think that uh, it looks like what the Democrats thought they could do and get away with in the last election and have Hillary elected, that they could do just anything they want. And I think they've been caught. And I think uh, if, uh, if it works out the way a lot of people are suspecting right now, there's going to be a bunch of those people that ended up trying to stick it to Trump. You could tell I'm not a super supporter of Trump for, you know, some philosophic reasons. But I do think that uh, he's been really ripped off on some of these charges made, and I think that uh, right now it looks like there's going to be enough information to try to disprove a lot of a lot of those lies that have been perpetuated by some of the media. Thank you for your call, Dave, 479-1080. What about uh, his second question, school shootings? You want to touch that or you want to move on to our... our uh... Well, I, I can very pre- briefly do it. You know, if you... Uh, I have a homeschooling program. We have never had a problem there. And there's a lot of private schools and uh, essentially never have it there. Uh, I think it's a government problem because they're government schools and they're not a lot to deal with, uh, you know, the true protection and, and they're, they're gun-free zones. So it is very complicated, but I, I don't think stricter the reaction all of the time is stricter gun laws are going to solve the problem that's not the case the worst episode of violence and killing in this country uh probably ever was 9-11 and they didn't have a gun so this idea that if we just get rid of the guns we're going to protect ourselves it, it doesn't work that way so uh that is a that is a serious problem it's probably blown out of proportion when you look at the statistics. You know, probably if you uh, got as much publicity on the inner city killings, you know, on a, on a weekend basis, uh, it's probably way over this. But it's very, very dramatic. It's very, very horrible. It's very, very sad. But it's very much played up, too. And it's played up for the whole purpose of taking guns away from the people who would like to protect themselves. Two one eight five seven two six with your text messages. I have one here about. Uh, they want to know what you think about the embassy moving to uh, uh, Jerusalem and and uh, and vaccines. And are you a coin collector? I have a question here about coins. Are you a coin collector? Yeah, I've collected coins for quite a few years. What's the most valuable coin that you have? Oh, well, I, you know, I did it as a kid, and then I didn't follow up. I'm not really into numismatics as much as it led me into the study of money and yeah. then actually using money, uh, you, you know, to, uh, to protect oneself against the inflation with it. Now, his, his other, what was the other question he started uh, vaccines, with? Vaccines, vaccines. Yeah, I think they're way overused. I am a physician. I think they've been overused. I think they're very dangerous. I don't believe in a prohibition, but, boy, I don't believe for one minute the government should determine you know about what parents do with their kids if they have concerns I, you know there's been stories where parents go to prison because they don't allow some inoculation but there i think there is definite evidence i've seen it myself where kids can get very very ill and have long-term very devastating complications from uh from vaccines but there's two extremes on that. No vaccines or take every one the government tells you that you should take. And, uh, no, I think there are some vaccines that, uh, you know, are, are reasonable. Uh, I think it was the, uh, 
the vaccine for polio that I witnessed as a kid when we feared horrendously, you know, polio, and yet within years that was eradicated. So, so that uh, that is, uh, is something. But I think they're way overused, and people ought to have the right to make their own decision about what's in their bodies. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, joining us here, Dr. Paul. What about uh, the embassy moving to, to Jerusalem? Do you have any uh, thoughts about that? Yeah, I think it was so unnecessary to stir up that trouble. There's going to be a lot of feedback from that. I just don't think, you know, Republican and Democrat presidents up to this time always said, even though the Congress said, yeah, it's okay, go ahead and move it. Um, it was always thought to be really going to be a, a big political party of a, a, a complication, uh, you know, in the Middle East. And they, once again, it represents an intervention that we don't need to do. Why, why should we make uh, make that decision? And that's a messy situation. I think every country should sit, sit say where their capital is going to be. But when it comes to Jerusalem and how how Israel came about and what the rules were set, where it was going to be an international city and how, how many rules were set where they were supposed to be shared it gets a little bit more complicated than uh, america saying well our capital is in in washington dc uh, mo- for the most part any capital should be determined by the state, uh, you, you know, by, by, the, by the government, and the other countries could uh, go there or not. But this is quite a bit different, and uh, I think it's going to lead to a lot more problems in the Middle East. There's already been a lot of ramifications from it. It, uh, it seemed, seemed to be unnecessary uh, to, uh, to do this, and it's very, very complex. I just don't even think, matter of fact, I think the further away we get from the Middle East, the be- better it would be. I think uh, we should have quit when the Crusades were over. Just stay out of the Middle East. We don't know. And that's why we're, you know, before before 9-11, we had plans laid by the New York neocons to remake the Middle East. But 9-11 set the stage where, oh, now we can remake the Middle East, and it's been going on ever since. And just look at all the killing that's been going on ever since. And we're in the middle of that, and uh, we should offer friendship and trade with people and, and get along with people, but we shouldn't be involved in. And I think this was an intervention that uh, stirred the pot in the Middle East and didn't help. Before we let you out of here, explain to me what's going on at the uh, Ron Paul Institute because you mentioned the homeschooling courses there as well, right? So, so let us know what's, what we can expect to find uh, by checking out the Ron Paul Institute. Well, if you go to Ron Paul uh, Institute, um, you will find out that we do have a homeschooling program. It's designed for uh, individuals that uh, can can do it on their own. There's no reason why parents have to sit with their kids. We have had, you know, just literally thousands of videos now for our program, and it's been very, very successful. And it's uh, it's free market and freedom oriented. It is, uh, you know, the history will not be the history you get in the government schools. You won't read and study and learn how to be a Keynesian economist. You're going to learn about, you know, uh, sound money, and you're going to learn about the Constitution and history in a completely different manner. It's the kind of thing that so many of us have to struggle for and our families struggle for to find the, right, the information. I know I spent 10, 15, 20 years once I figured out that what I'd been taught wasn't correct to find the right information. And the one group that did help me out was the Foundation for Economic Education. So I've always been interested in education, and uh, this is something that the worse the schools get, the more attention we're getting on our home school, home school curriculum. All right, we want to encourage everybody to check out the Ron Paul Institute. Dr. Ron Paul, I thank you once again for joining us here on Flight 1080. An absolute honor to have you on our airwaves. Thank you very much. Nice to be with you. That was Dr. Ron Paul.